The 20th century passed through revolutions, paradigm shifts in the sciences, the Great Depression, cultural reinventions, historical hatred, and then hatred presented with the innovation of microphones, television broadcasts, a voice on the world stage, and then hatred given new weapons and tanks, the stage collapsing and then rebuilt and then enlarged, and then new hopes, a new myth, unbelievable progress, new technology and new commerce and new theories and a new future. There's something alien about the 20th century. It appears in world history like a comet that screams, burns through the atmosphere, strikes the world like a hammer, then ripples through tectonic plates and oceans, a shockwave that clicks into the brain a new consciousness. We have inherited the future of the 20th century. Yet that future has changed. This graph shows a language of progress forming into one of caution over the course of 400 years. Why are we so worried about what's to come? Progress, or the desire and admiration and ethos of progress, seems to be the engine of Western civilization. That engine relies on science. What is the origin of the peculiarly scientific basis of our high civilization? In our present generation, we may stand on the shoulder of giants and examine in considerable detail the history of science in China, the complexities of Babylonian mathematics and astronomy, the machinations of the keepers of the Mayan calendar, and the scientific fumblings of the ancient Egyptians. Now that we have some feeling for what was possible and what not for these peoples, we can see clearly that Western civilization must somewhere have taken a different turn that made the scientific tradition much more productive than in all these other cases. It was within this complex of countries we call Western civilization, with their expansion of trade markets throughout the globe and the first ever forming of corporations as an instrument to fund and profit from circumnavigation that engendered the dynamics of a new system, capitalism, that incentivized and depended on progress. England's massive hoarding of wealth from the slave and sugar trade later fueled industrialization. The sciences became a vehicle to keep industry growing and innovating. Change was rapid in a way never experienced before. Everything new is always uncertain. For some, the automobile would kill off the beloved horse. Planes breached the sanctity of the sky and mocked God. Chemistry was a technical word for the black magic of alchemy. The transmission of someone's voice through radio waves would spark a new form of insanity. Every new technology has its proponents and detractors. Culture surrounds our tools, which create more than just what they're built for. They fashion our dreams and fears. We craft narratives around their terrible or wondrous power. We go to schools to study them, to get jobs through them, to form in and out groups centered on who's using the newest method, who's a true one or who's just another poser, and so on. Our tools groove new paths into our collective future, both practically and ideologically. This is the maniac. Mathematical, analyzer, numerical, integrator, and automatic computer model. A machine built by John von Neumann in 1952. Maniac's first task was to calculate the thermonuclear reactions of hydrogen bombs. Neumann predicted the development of his machine into something that would surpass human intellect. He's considered the father of artificial intelligence. His architecture is still what we use in modern computers. He was the one who came up with the term singularity, a point in time where artificial general intelligence is reached and can advance itself without human intervention and improve exponentially. To Neumann, it seemed like all of civilization had been gathering towards an event horizon, where soon all structure and comprehension of natural human life and society would be leached of its contents, throttled at light speed, and transformed into freshly minted energy to feed a machine god. 
So, the creation of artificial general intelligence would be the end of history, or of history as we conceptualize it. Neumann believed that such an intelligence cannot be built. It has to grow, in the same way a biological being grows and matures. It also has to be able to play and make mistakes, a lot of mistakes, which is how it will evolve and become better and better. He started studying biology and evolution. He contributed to theories about self-replicating machines. But at that time in the 50s, these ideas could not even be debated. They were so new and complex. Concerns were still focused on the coming of nuclear war. For a long time after Neumann's death in 1957, AI research went into periods of what were called AI winters, spanning from the 70s until the early 2000s. The U.S. government saw within the research departments of universities a promise of beating the USSR. Noam Chomsky was one of the academics who received funding. He was called on to create machine translation, but failed. The Light Hill Report of 1973 read that AI research had been nothing but disappointment, and so withdrew the UK's involvement in anything AI related. Globally, funding wasn't going anywhere. The field seemed rooted in faulty assumptions of what could be done with technology. No one wanted to go all in on any more speculations. But now, in the last few years, sentiments have not only changed, but have been supercharged in one direction or another. Who could have predicted this after decades of failure? We are now going back to Neumann, back to the hard to see truths of science fiction, to videos and blog posts and Twitter feeds. What is happening and what are we heading into? Are we doomed or saved? When the 20th century passed to the next, it did so through a power grid. The 90s saw an adoption, a boom, of a new technology that would not only change the economy but also the way we think and communicate our perception of time and place. The internet surely had its opponents, but obviously now who battles against the internet? But when it was crawling through homes and workplaces, through schools and industry, it inspired the worst of the pessimists among us. Now we're witnessing something akin to it, and its future is equally as uncertain. Two groups have formed to face it. Generally, they can be called decelerationists and accelerationists, specifically effective altruists and effective accelerationists. One wants to put roadblocks in AI development in what it believes to be best for humanity, and the other wants to let it run free. Effective altruism was a set of closely related moral ideas formed by philosophers during the 2000s. The name was coined in 2011 and unified an ethic that advocated social and legal actions with the most power to benefit the most human lives. The term was elevated to the mainstream by effective altruist Sam Bankman Freed. I, I realized I didn't want to go into academia and uh, I started to get involved in, in effective altruism, which is basically a movement looking at if you want to have positive impact on the world, how do you maximize that? Or at least do the best that you can. Like, think about it not in terms of like, do at least one unit of good, um, but instead of like, how many units of good can you do, given, you know, what, what resources you have at your disposal. And, uh, and so I, I started looking. A man who claimed to be making a life out of earning to give. Appearing in 2022 on Twitter, Effective accelerationism is an attack to the ethic of Ealt in technology, where Ealt says new technologies might threaten to wipe out life on Earth and reducing this risk might be a key priority. EAC says no, impossible. The point of technology is and has always been for the betterment of people. With intelligence, we can manipulate nature, create a different form of nature that is most conducive to our thriving. It is this very act of creation that makes us human, that sets us apart. Problems can be solved not by removal, but by addition. We can innovate and create solutions to whatever problem, even the ones technology creates. In fact, we should try to create as much as we can, and as fast as we can, and rid ourselves of these prejudices and age-old nightmares of technological progress for the sake of current and future humans. 
So is EAC another call for Utopia, a right-wing or a left-wing dream? Although championing free market capitalism, it seeks to go beyond politics. There's only one war that matters. Are you on the side of technology or against technology? This is the dividing line. We don't have conservatives and liberals anymore. We have A-cell and D-cell. This is Mosaic, a web browser, the first of its kind, co-authored in 1993 by Mark Andreessen, the tech investor and billionaire who has impacted all of our lives, because he is one of the forerunners of our modern internet. He's prolific on social media, has a lot of opinions, very well read in humanities and sciences and literature. He's also a diehard advocate of EAC, which he has popularized. On October 16th, 2023, he published a manifesto on techno-optimism. It has now become a moral guideline for accelerationists. Technology is the glory of human ambition and achievement, the spearhead of progress and the realization of our potential. For hundreds of years we properly glorified this until recently. I am here to bring the good news. We can advance to a far superior way of living and of being. We have the tools, the systems, the ideas. We have the will. It is time once again to raise the technology flag. It is time to be techno-optimists. This is Nick Land. The term techno-capital machine is his invention. He's listed as a patron saint of techno-optimism. He's considered the father of accelerationism in its techno-capital variation. And now we come full circle to the 20th century. This is Karl Marx. If anyone has read him, they probably read the Communist Manifesto. He was very optimistic about capitalism. The bourgeoisie, during its rule of scarce 100 years, has created more massive and more colossal productive forces than have all preceding generations together. What earlier century had even a presentment that such productive forces slumbered in the lap of social labor. Accelerationism grew in the shadows of growing industries, of rapid technological change. It was a reaction to a world in massive flux. And it said keep going faster and faster onto the next stage. Marx believed that the only way to bring about his ideal of communism was by the progress of capitalism, which contained the contradictions that if allowed free reign would naturally destroy itself. If revolution were to happen in a society not already well developed, then communism would not have the foundation to be successful. It is Marx who remains the paradigmatic accelerationist thinker. Contrary to the all too familiar critique, he was not a thinker who resisted modernity but rather one who sought to analyze and intervene within it, understanding that for all its exploitation and corruption, capitalism remained the most advanced economic system to date. Its gains were not to be reversed, but accelerated beyond the constraints the capitalist value form. In the 60s and 70s, philosophers in France, what we now call the postmodernists, grew disappointed by the failures of communism and the ruinous coupling of theory to practice. In 1968, massive riots threatened civil war in France. The leftist dream was happening. But then, someone woke up. It ended as quickly as it started. The Grenell Accords settled the demands of the working class. The Conservative Party was re-elected and stronger than ever. Marxists expected blood and upheaval, but the population only wanted social change and what they got was sufficient enough. And so, these French intellectuals went back to Marx, reading him obsessively, trying to form a new and relevant Marxism. No more visions of bloody revolution like what happened in Russia. That was an old way of thinking, not suited for a more modern populace that abhorred violence. A seminal book, Anti-Oedipus, by Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, 
claimed it was far more productive to socialist efforts to improve capitalism, let it run rampant, take it to its final conclusion. No need for a revolution. It'll destroy itself by its own nature. In a Lex Friedman podcast, Guillaume Verdun, or Beth Jesus, one of the originators of the term effective accelerationism, said, there's no formal organization whatsoever. I just put out tweets and certain blog posts and people are free to deflect. And so that makes it so that there should be a sort of deterritorialization in the space of ideas. I use this quote specifically because of one word, deterritorialization. It means, according to Wikipedia, deterritorialization and reterritorialization occur simultaneously and are used to characterize a constant process of transformation, according to Giles Deleuze and Felix Guattari. I assume Verdone has not actually read their writings. However, he's been exposed to their language and concepts through the work of Nick Land, whose philosophy is a darker extension of anti-Oedipus. In a recent debate, AI decelerationist Connor Leahy told Verdone to take techno-capitalism to its logical conclusion. That's what Nick Land did. He allegedly used to be a Marxist, and he was doing Marxist capital analysis of what happens when techno-capital gains more and more power. And his conclusion was eventually, there was only capital, there's no labor, until there's no people, there's no happiness. Capital itself becomes sentient. In Leahy's words, Nick Land is the only accelerationist who bites the bullet. Though he didn't come up with the term accelerationism, it seems to first appear in a 2010 book called The Persistence of the Negative by Benjamin Noyes. Using it to describe these particular ideas in French social theory after 1968. This is the logo of the Cybernetic Culture Research Unit, formed in 1995 by Nick Land, Sandy Plant, and Mark Fisher. Their work deviated from even the most esoteric academic thought, becoming what would later be called theory fiction. We are hurtling into the first globally integrated insanity. Politics is obsolete. Capitalism and schizophrenia hacked into a future that programs it down to its punctuation, connecting with the eminent inevitability of viral revolution, soft fusion. No longer infections threatening the integrity of organisms, but immunopolitical relics obstructing the integration of global VIM control. And if we think this can be stopped, we are even more stupid than we seem. In the 90s, Nick Land turned philosophy into cognitive art. His style and subject matter eventually created a kind of cult of personality around him and inspired others to copy his style and redirect their research interests. A global apocalypse is coming and should be welcomed. Disorder must increase. Any organization is a mere detour in the inexorable death flow. Land is like a messenger brought back in time from a dystopian cyber hell, a monstrous and polluted landscape where humans are merely a raw wetware for the exploitation of an all-consuming, beast-headed, techno-capitalist machine. In the late 90s, Land started using amphetamines to augment his writing, accelerate the flow, excite visions of sublime excess. The thing is, he knew exactly how he was perceived how to craft narratives that captured attention, and to take those narratives and make them mythic. He formed the CCRU around the concept of hyperstition, in his own words, the experimental science of self-fulfilling prophecies. The early 2000s saw land in his most exuberant, scopic, and creative capacities. A political orientation was now perceptible in the frenzy of intellectual mania. Democracy is as close to a precise negation of civilization as anything could be, short of instantaneous social collapse into murderous barbarism or zombie apocalypse, which it eventually leads to. As the democratic virus burns through society, 
painstakingly accumulated habits and attitudes of forward-thinking prudential human and industrial investment are replaced by a sterile, orgiastic consumerism, financial incontinence, and a reality television political circus. In democracy's place, Land envisioned a techno-feudalism where corporations act like kingdoms. Society would be ruled by the intellectual elites of these kingdoms, those with the capital and brain power, of course augmented by cybernetics, would be at the top of the hierarchy. Multiculturalism, social liberalism would be non-existent. The new age of eugenics would birth a hyper-intelligent race to re-engineer the planet into a techno-utopia. For Nick Land, accelerationism is merely expediting the exit strategy of this civilization onto the next. Free market capitalism will create the ideal conditions for the new world. Whether that new world is something we actually want or not doesn't matter. The techno-capital machine can't be stopped. Intelligence is the main driver of societal progress, so it only makes sense that we have to speed up the development of AI systems to bring them closer and then far beyond what even the most intelligent human beings can do. Where we're headed through accelerationism is the techno-capital singularity, Land's unique play on the technological singularity of John von Neumann. Without accelerationism, we are doomed to the zombie apocalypse, what Land calls democracy. Somehow, through whatever evolution of memes or dialectic of irony, Land's ideas have become the springboard for a new myth. That is effective accelerationism. The founders are based Beth Jesus, Bayes Lord, Gestular, and Cretine Cycle. EAC has been formed by computer scientists, inheritors of the internet, curators of global knowledge, and so it makes sense of itself through a specialized language, using advanced analogies, memology, making connections with disparate domains, and grounding itself in science. It claims that we can make sense of life, its emergence and propagation, and future through thermodynamics. In a July 9, 2022 blog post titled Notes on EAC Principles and Tenets, Guillaume Verdon, still anonymous and using his Beth Jizo pseudonym, and Bayslord, who's still unknown, make mention of a theory of the origin of life by physicist Jeremy England. Life emerged from an out-of-equilibrium thermodynamic process, known as dissipative adaptation. Matter reconfigures itself such as to extract energy and utility from its environment, such as to serve towards the preservation and replication of its unique phase of matter. The planet is a bastion of energy. Life pops into existence to capture it. Life is a sort of fire that seeks out free energy in the universe and seeks to grow, and that growth is fundamental to life. According to Beth's and Bayslord's blog post, intelligence evolves as a means for an entity to capture greater amounts of free energy. Humans are therefore astonishingly good energy-capturing animals, the best in the game. Humans, in large part, are able to do this because of consciousness, which allows them to make goal-orientated models of their environment, setting up the highly useful cognitive mapping of past and future. Civilization is a form of social consciousness, or what Beth and Bayslord call a meta-meta-organism. One system, capitalism, sets up civilization to best use the free energy of its environment. It does this through technology and incentivizing the creation of ever more better technology. Capitalism is hence a form of intelligence, dynamically morphs the meta-meta-organism such that any sort of energy in the environment is captured and utilized towards the maintenance and growth of civilization. What was once Nick Land's techno-capital singularity has been replaced with asymptotic limit, a mathematical term meaning simply the limit of a distribution a logical conclusion of capitalism. Forestalling the asymptotic limit is forestalling the progress of civilization, or the inherent law of the universe. What I find fascinating about EAC is what we as human beings do in the face of societal change. We reinterpret and reinvent, justify and condemn, and re-justify. We enliven ourselves with either pessimism or optimism, 
form short-lived cyber cults, pseudo cults, debate what cult even means, and then reject any negative connotation to later claim a group that's not a cult is ineffective, not serious enough. We fashion fears and dreams out of uncertainty, and then seek leaders to guide us out of that very uncertainty, to march us towards a future or past, whatever our preference. Hyperstition is real. Whether the future is good or bad, we're right.